Today, I'll show you how low back pain and sciatica are often caused by peripheral sensitization. This is where the neurons in your low back, hips, and really anywhere in your body become extra sensitive. Let's go back to our gate analogy. The brain is a fortress in the center of a city with multiple walls and multiple gates in the center. In order to get to the brain and deliver a message, we have to travel along a road. Peripheral sensitization is where outside the city gates, People are rioting in the streets, setting houses on fire. Everything is a mess. In other words, we have a ton of inflammation. People talk about inflammation a lot, but I'm actually going to break down what inflammation is, literally, physically. And then later, we'll break down what to do about it. This is part of my pain neuroscience series where we've already covered a lot of information about the neuroscience and neuroanatomy of pain. If you haven't seen those videos, go watch those, and we've got a lot more to come. And welcome, if you're new here, my name is Dr. Anthony Davis, and I empower people with chronic back pain and sciatica to reclaim the active life they deserve. And of course, if you ever need one-on-one -on -one help, you can watch the masterclass and book a call to see if we can help. So peripheral sensitization can often start with an initial injury. Now, for many of you, that's lifting something heavy, perhaps having a disc herniation, pulling a muscle or something of that nature. But for this example, I'm going to use something that is very textbook, and that is a splinter entering the tissue, which, by the way, is a great metaphor for a lot of types of low back pain because a splinter is a very minor injury, but it causes an inordinate amount of pain. In the same way, many causes of low back pain and sciatica are not nearly as serious as most people think they are, but they can cause a crazy amount of pain. So when a splinter enters the skin, and let's pretend this is skin, then the nerve receptors would get the signal because they're damaged. And of course, again, a splinter could represent any type of tissue, disc herniation, muscle tear, you name it. Well, the damage to the tissue from the splinter would release prostaglandins and other chemicals into the area, which lead to inflammation. Inflammation means that immune cells like mast cells and macrophages would rush to the area to try to help repair the damaged tissue and fight infections. And these cells would release cytokines and histamines and other inflammatory mediators. This would increase the blood flow to the area, bringing even more immune cells, which would, of course, in turn release more cytokines, more histamine, and then further the cycle, the inflammatory cycle or cascade. And this is just a small part of the picture, but the focus here is that there is a lot of inflammation. And with inflammation, we're going to have redness, swelling, heat, and pain. The interesting thing is that even though the splinter is actually a minor injury, most of the pain is not from the tissue damage, most of the pain is a result of this chemical soup that happens after the injury. So things are disproportionately painful compared to the level of injury that occurred. And that, in a nutshell, is peripheral sensitization. Things are way more sensitive than they should be. The next thing that happens is called neuroimmune crosstalk. All of the cytokines and other inflammatory chemicals that are released as a result of your injury are like a magnet for immune cells or white blood cells. Things like mast cells, macrophages, and neutrophils are going to rush to the area. And their job is to eat the damaged tissue, clean up, uh, and prevent infection. They're your cleanup crew. But then these additional immune cells release even more cytokines, which leads to more inflammation. This hypersensitizes the nerve receptors in the same way that we talked about in the video on central sensitization, where the ion channels change. There's a lot of changes that happen that make your nerves extra sensitive and inflamed. And then because the nerves are inflamed, they are going to release substance P and CGRP, as well as other things. And these are another form of inflammation. This neurogenic inflammation not only resensitizes the nerve. So the nerve creates substance P and CGRP, which actually make itself more sensitive. And then it goes to bring more blood flow to the area as well and call more immune cells, which then begins the cycle over and over. And now we're kind of trapped in this little micro environment. So how do your nerve cells become extra sensitive? We covered this in greater depth in the central sensitization video. So I'm going to fly through this, but if you want more detail, watch that video. So 
what happens is that the neurotransmitters are changing. We have chemicals that are released by the ends of your nerves that are neurotransmitters that help send a signal. These are things like substance P, CGRP, and glutamate, and these are inflammatory. Basically, to send a message along a nerve, you need to increase the voltage along the nerve, and then we will send a message. At rest, your cells are not very high voltage, but with damage or irritation, sodium rushes into the cell, and if enough sodium rushes into the cell, we cross a certain threshold, and if we cross that threshold, we send a danger message, an electrical signal, up to the spinal cord and possibly up to the brain. Anytime that I talk about gates um, as a metaphor, then we're talking about actually sending an action potential or getting across ion channels. When your nerves are extra sensitive, they start off at rest at a high voltage. So it only takes a little bit of sodium to set them off. They're just really sensitive. It's easy to send a false alarm signal. Classic example is a sunburn, okay? Peripheral sensitization is like a sunburn. Your skin is extra sensitive. Putting on a t-shirt, taking a hot shower, hurt like hell, even though the hot shower and, the, and putting on a t-shirt are not damaging. They are not creating more damage. The sunburn, the damage is already done. Um, you're just extra sensitive while you heal. Another big change that happens in the ends of nerves is the ion channel changes. Again, I covered this in greater detail in the central sensitization video, but I'm just going to fly through this. Basically, in the spinal cord, we have these gates, which are like ion channels, and we have a lot more ion channels. So literally the genes that code for ion channels upregulate the production of more ion ion channels. So it's easy to get that sodium across the membrane and send off a danger signal accidentally. Additionally, we have leaky channels. So normally here's a membrane. We can only get a certain amount of sodium across at a time, but the channels become leaky and we get tons of sodium flooding in that should not be flooding in. And leaky channels are like, hey, each of these gates lets in way too many people. And some of these people should have never gotten through in the first place. So again, we're sending false messages because the ion channels themselves are dysregulated. The next thing that happens that's very interesting is called nerve sprouting or receptor field enlargement. What what that means is that if we have the end of a nerve receptor, we have these branches on the end of them and we've got inflammation. Well, inflammation leads to irritation of the nerve and the nerve ends up sprouting. So we get all these extra brown branches and with each extra branch, we have more opportunities to get irritated, basically get inflamed. And then each end of the nerve then can create more inflammation and then receive more sensitivity. And then it's a self-propagating cycle. And this leads leads to hyperalgesia, which is increased pain from things that are supposed to hurt, okay? So things that should hurt because they're a sufficient enough stimulus, those things hurt way more than they normally would. And we also get allodynia, which is you get pain from safe stimuli. So now things that should hurt, hyperalgesia, hurt way more. And things that should not hurt because they are not dangerous, they are not damaging, even those things hurt because of all of the reasons that I've discussed so far. So let me know in the comments. I'm curious, does this description of hypersensitivity of the nerves ring any bells? If so, do you think that you have a little bit of hypersensitivity of some of those low back or sciatic or hip muscles or nerves or joints or anything like that? If so, let me know what's going on in the comments. The next thing that happens is called neurogenic inflammation, which happens partially as a result of retrograde firing or antidromal potentials. So normally we have a nerve cell, it senses the damage or inflammation, and it's going to send a signal to the spinal cord, and then a new nerve cell is going to send a, a signal up to the brain. But if we have retrograde or antidromal action potentials, which a lot of people, we don't really talk about this um, much in our neuroanatomy classes in schools, um, so a lot of people People forget about this, but um, a, a nerve, even a sensory nerve, this is the part that most people mess up. Even a sensory nerve can send signals backwards, and that's called a retrograde or antidromal action potential. Anyway, we send a signal backwards towards the receptor end, and also, by the way, as a result of stress chemicals, right, uh, uh, your cortisol, adrenaline, that type of thing, this is also going to feed these antidromal potentials. Well, here's what happens. We're going to zoom into the end of the neuron 
here, the sensory receptor end. Again, these are the receptors that are in your low back or in your hips or wherever it's painful. Okay, so now we're really zoomed in on the end of the receptor and we've got these little branches here. Um, and what's gonna happen is we've got a little bit of an inflammatory stimulus here. So we're gonna send the main signal goes up here. So it goes up to the, the spinal cord and to the brain. But at the same time that we're sending, sending the signal up the nerve, we're also going to send a signal up and back down and then and back down and back down to all of the other branches. And when we do that, each of those branches is going to release substance P and CGRP and other things that lead to more inflammation. And that extra inflammation hypersensitizes each of these new nerve branches. And then each of those nerve branches will send their own signal up to the spinal cord and to the brain. And then again, that's going to send more antidromal signals back to the ends of the nerves, which hypersensitizes them, releases more inflammatory chemicals, which makes your nerves more sensitive. More signals go up, more signals go down, more inflammation, more up, more down, more inflammation, more up, more down, more inflammation. So we are just dealing with this major inflammatory cascade, this positive feedback loop of inflammation, sensitivity, inflammation, sensitivity. But where it gets really weird is that the brain can actually cause this to happen. Yes, it can happen as a result of injury, but the brain can cause it to happen too. Your brain can literally create inflammation in your body by making your nerves send an action potential backwards to the ends of the nerves and create inflammation by basically squirting out these inflammatory chemicals that make your nerves sensitive. And sometimes Sometimes people get hung up about the idea that, oh, pain is in your brain and like my thoughts have something to do with pain and, you know, that's a bunch of hippie stuff and like it's, it's mind over, you know, mind over matter or whatever. Um, I don't know. People get confused about this and then they blame their thoughts or they are refuse to acknowledge their thoughts. They go to one extreme or the other. But here's the deal. What do you think a thought is? What do you think a thought is? A thought is just a collection of electrical signals um, transmitting from a, a ton of neurons to other neurons and just, you know, pinging around. We've just got this electrical signature in the body and in the brain that creates thoughts and experiences and hunger and love and hatred and fear and pain and and pleasure and you know all the things right those are all just electrical signals so if we start messing with the electricity with all this inflammation well yeah okay and then of course your brain can cause that to happen thoughts are just electrical signals thoughts can send electrical signals anywhere and in this case can lead to actual inflammation that leads to uh, again legitimate pain um, first of all all pain is legitimate but I'm, I just want to really emphasize that even if a thought causes the pain the thought caused a physical reaction in the end of the nerve. So even if a thought caused the pain, the thought created a real, physical, tangible thing that happened that is creating pain. Okay, so today we learned that peripheral sensitization is where the ends of your nerves in the body, in the back, in the disc, in the nerve, in the joint, in the muscle are extra sensitive. And what happens is, yes, we can have an initial injury. And after that initial injury, we're going to have a bunch of uh, a chemical cocktail of inflammation. Um, we're going to have neuroimmune crosstalk where immune cells rush to the scene to clean up the debris, fight infection, but they squirt out chemical, you know, inflammatory mediators that make your nerves extra sensitive. And then your nerves call more immune cells in to fix the issue, and then it's back and forth. Then we learned about membrane hyperexcitability, where the ends of the nerve receptors are extra sensitive to chemical changes, and they send off lots of false danger messages. On top of that, the ion channels themselves are changing. So again, sodium rushes into the membrane when it should not be rushing in, and again, we send off false alarm signals. But hey, when these signals get to the brain, your brain doesn't know the difference. All the brain knows is, oh my gosh, I'm getting a signal from that area in my back. There must be something dangerous. On top of that, we have nerve sprouting, where we get extra sensitivity in an even wider field. So now our pain starts to spread out and do weird things. And then the ends of the nerves can actually create more inflammation through neurogenic inflammation. And that can be a self-fulfilling prophecy where the inflammation locally actually triggers the nerve to create more inflammation in the region or it can come from outside the body, like your stress response, your stress hormones, or even thoughts, or directly down from the brain, 
In either case, your nerves themselves can inflame that area physically, chemically, and tangibly. Now, so far in this series, we've talked about a lot of things, including central sensitization, where the gates and the roads that go to the brain are just wide open. We're getting a lot of signals passing through that should not be passing through, where we should have like TSA, you know, security guards stopping and frisking and making sure that only certain people get through. Instead, everybody's getting through. And so everything is really sensitive. The brain is getting bombarded with messages. Today, we covered peripheral sensitization, which is where outside of the city walls, again, there's rioting in the streets, houses are on fire, there's tons of inflammation. Next time, we're going to be talking about the brain itself and more systemic changes where we're, we have descending modulation from the brain and cortical smudging and some other really interesting neuro and anatomical things. Basically, the brain can choose between one of two reactions. It can either send and um, the fire department to put out the fires, or sometimes it sends the military because it thinks it's at war and the military, well, what happens with the military is there's collateral damage, there's extra fire, there's extra pain and suffering, right? So how, how does the brain decide what happens? How does that all work? Are we going to send in the fire department, put the fires out or the military and actually create more fires? So look for that video on how the brain controls pain and I will see you there.